Hey there, friends. Dave Politis, k Missing Project, a cup Reddit edition for our video channel. And uh, back in the silo, still freezing cold. And uh, it's actually freezing cold in here. But uh, I'm glad you're with me. And uh, it's been an interesting week. I got a call from a friend of mine that watches the channel here regularly. Big fan. Big friend. And... Uh, he goes, Dave, you got to remind your viewers of something about China. And the people out there that don't want to hear this, you need to hear it because it's coming around the corner quickly. Who, Dave, this is what he asked me, he says, who, Dave, would want our armed forces depleted except our adversaries? And what is happening with our armed forces right now if you don't get the jab you're gone that's right if you don't get the vaccination you're gone who is more important in our infrastructure and our safety in the world other than our military yet our administration has enforced the postal service to get vaccinated and guess who else hasn't been forced to be vaccinated? The CDC. Well, isn't that something? Why would that be? Think about it, folks. Come on, you're smart. You can do this. People always say, well, what can I do? Well, what you can do is a large percentage of the American population takes pharmaceutical drugs, whatever it might be for. I'll say this to you again, that if we get into a conflict with China, they're shutting down the supply of all drugs to our, our economy, life-saving drugs. And since over 90% of all generics are made in China and over 80% of our pharmaceutical drugs are made in China, if you're on some medication that's life-saving medication, you're dead. That's right, you're dead. So write to your pharmaceutical company and tell them to start manufacturing the drug in either India or, China, or uh, Vietnam. Those are the two choices where companies are going right now. And there are a heck of a lot better choices than China. So please, people say, oh, China's not our problem. Folks, there's no other bigger problem in our world right now. And if you're on the side of the fence defending China because you believe in rights, then you better pick your head up out of that sand quickly. You see, China has what's called concentration camps. And if somebody like me was talking bad about their country, they'd be in a concentration camp because nobody talks bad about China. That's right. Because guess what? The state, China, the Communist Party of China, controls their media. That's right. Which is why just recently, China told Apple to take down the Bible and the Koran off of their applications website for access to Chinese people. They control what they read. They control what they hear. Hmm. Kind of the way some tech companies do here in America. Hmm. Well, that's troubling, isn't it? Folks, I'm telling you, I hear things about China every day from friends, on, from news sources, to disaster. You know, it takes us two years to train a fighter pilot. And you know how many fighter pilots are leaving the military in the next month and going to work for airlines that don't require vaccinations? A lot. Some of our most seasoned ones. It is such a disaster. I can't believe it's happening. Okay, so we got the military over here and they have to get vaccinated. But we got the postal service here who doesn't have to get vaccinated. And then the people who are mandating the vaccines, the CDC, they don't have to be vaccinated. Oh, what is going on in our world? Why are 
are we allowing this to happen? I gotta keep my cool, stay the focus. That's my rant for today. And I'm sorry if you don't like hearing the facts, but the facts are China's coming around the corner quickly. And I used to think, well, this is only the last four or five years that this has really started to happen. I really got an education the other day from someone and it's been going on for over 40 years. But it's become more blatant and more obvious in the last couple years. The Chinese government are brilliant. I, and this isn't a slam on the Chinese people at all. They're pawns in this. They're like prisoners of war, let's face it. And the Chinese government knew a long time ago that it'd be much, much safer, cost less lives, if we destroy the United States from the middle meaning we get their own people to destroy themselves. That's what's happening right now. Our own people are destroying our own country under the belief that it could be much better ran as a socialist regime. regime. And if you think that the people in China would follow that thinking, you're crazy. The people that have come from China that are in think tanks around the US. They're getting throttled right now and they're not being heard. But if you listen to them on some of the channels, folks, they're telling you it's a dictatorship. There's no freedoms. You're told how much you can make. You're classed up as a people. If you speak out, you go to a camp. I never thought I'd be talking to people like this about our country and about the need to wake up. But I am, I am talking about it and I will continue to talk about it. On to the letters. Hey Dave, I was introduced to your books years ago and I've been intrigued by your work ever since. I'm a subscriber to your channel and appreciate your honesty and conviction on all your topics that you discuss. Thank you for doing the important work into the mysteries of this amazing world we live in and also the discussions on current cultural topics that affect us all. Thank you. I'm sending you a story pertaining to hikers and or hunters having strange encounters. I've shared your work with many friends and family and one of those is my older brother. We watched your movie The Hunted together several months ago and something occurred in the movie that triggered a reaction to him that was intense. I'll return to this point, but allow me to see the backstory, set the backstory. We grew up in Missoula, Montana. That's about two hours south of me. And in the late 80s, just prior to him graduating high school, he took a trip with a friend to visit family and friends that they both had in Southern California. While traveling through the area of Southern Oregon into Northern California, they drove by a Sasquatch that was standing just off the road or the shoulder of the road. It was in the middle of the night in a very densely forested mountain pass. There was good illumination from the moon and the headlights were on bright. And with the Sasquatch being less than 10 feet from my brother who was in the passenger seat as they passed, there was no mistaken identity or it being a bear or any other possible explanation of what he saw. The Sasquatch was in the ditch that ran along the road, which was angled downward at a height from the road level where water runs off. Despite this, the Sasquatch was at eye level with them as they passed in their Toyota four-wheel drive pickup, which has a substantial amount of ground clearance. The encounter with these creatures is rare and amazing in and of itself, but, that, but what still haunts my brother to this day is the fact that it was holding a large stick in its hand, and what he describes as having a walking stick. Beyond the physical encounter, he also speaks of the intense feeling that the way that it stared at him and followed their movement with its head as he passed and described it as though it had been waiting for them to pass as a person would wait for a car to pass before crossing the street. The simple fact impressed upon him that there was a definite sense of awareness and understanding from this biped. He described it as massive with the usual physical descriptions, long hair, muscular build, etc. but with the almost surreal resemblance of a human face. 
They continued their trip but experienced high strangeness, strangeness later that night. He cannot still to this day fully remember the timeline and the order of how things occurred. He only remembers that they continued on immediately after the sighting in stunned silence of what they had seen. The next thing he remembers is that they were on the side of the road in a small town which, which he could only describe as seemingly in the desert or seemingly to be deserted. He was now in the driver's seat and looked over to see his friend sleeping. He woke him up to have him drive. As they continued, they were both uncertain as to when they had switched seats and where they were even at. A quick but hugely important side note, both of them were young, healthy teenagers who were adept at going long periods of time without sleep, and they were not drug users, drinking alcohol, or otherwise impaired. Also, both of these guys are honest to a fault, and I trust my brother's words and actions without question. They continued to discuss the fact that they were both unaware of how they got to the town or even what town they were in. They both thought that the other had been driving and both felt as though they were in a short mental fog. His friend then asked if my brother recalled that shortly after the sighting that he had fallen asleep but had awoken yelling to hit the brakes and pointed into the tree line ahead of them. His friend responded immediately not knowing what was happening, only to have multiple deer come into the road. They would have had no chance to swerve or stop had this not have happened, and the deer were not visible to his friend until they had stopped. My brother had no recollection, recollection of this at all. They decided to park and both rest till daybreak. Neither of them cannot completely recall that night, nor describe the overwhelming feeling of time loss, memory loss, the eerily deserted town, or what occurred after the sighting. They are both unsure of what highway they were on or what town they ended up in. Years later, back in Montana, they were out deer hunting along with his friend's girlfriend when they experienced loud, guttural sounds, and then an immediate and overwhelming dank smell came over them. They knew from literature on Sasquatch that they had read after the experience that this noise and smell was and sprinted back down the trail to the truck. The girlfriend did not know what was happening, but she too was very aware of what she heard and smelled. It was not anything she could explain. Years later, my brother went elk hunting with his two friends. They were in the greater Missoula area in mountainous terrain. It was heavily wooded, spotted with creeks, and even some areas that were slightly marshy. The friends decided that they would do a large looping maneuver and come in hunting and attempt to drive any elk in the area towards a spot they had selected for my brother to wait at. Several hours passed and then my brother began to hear what he thought were voices in the distance. He continued to wait silently and intently listening, thinking that it was his friends approaching and there may be an elk in the immediate vicinity. The voices began to get louder and he knew that they were coming almost directly towards him. As the voices were getting louder, he began to hear movement to his left in an area that had heavy underbrush about 20 yards away. The voices were near enough now that he realized that he was hearing what he was hearing were voices, but there was not any distinct vocabulary being used, which would have been the case if it were his friends or any other hunters. The voices seemed to be communicating back and forth, but still were not visible. Then as he stared intently into the area of which the voices or noises were located, he, he spotted perhaps for only two or three seconds an animal that I can only describe as a wolf-like creature talked about in Skinwalker Ranch book. However, this creature was almost a pinkish, seemingly hairless animal. He continued to pass unseen, but still making the sounds. He only saw one creature, but had the sense that there were two by a back and forth communication. I refer now back to the opening paragraph describing his response to your movie. The sounds that were recorded by those hunters in the Sierras is what my brother responded to. His reaction was intense and with disbelief. It was, quoting, holy shit, that is what I heard. I did not know what he was referring to as he had not told anybody about this experience. Who would talk about something like that? It's hard enough to describe it when you hear the recordings. Our family now lives in Boise. My dad and brother were over elk hunting in the area around Craters of the Moon about five years ago. My mom grew up in Cary, Idaho, so they would go hunt and visit family there. While traveling to Cary after the day of hunting, they looked into the sky and saw what I would believe to be a Foo Fighter. 
They described the object much like the aviators did in World War II as flying objects that appeared to be on fire. It held a relatively level flight path as it seemed to parallel their direction for, of travel for several minutes before it went out of sight. For people who don't know, in World War II, the, our aviators would describe seeing these flying objects around their planes a lot. Some people would call them orbs today. Other people said they were like flying round balls of fire. They weren't aircraft. They moved with distinct identity and thought. A lot of aviators talked about it. I felt I should relay these experiences with his permission because you requested that in the least I could do in some small way to help you accumulate this information. I have no doubt that there are others around the world who encounter high strangeness but do not share it because of the ridicule that often accompanies it. That is why I know for a fact the work you are doing is so vitally important. It gives people a voice and to let them know they are not crazy or alone. Your profile points are spot on as is your investigative approach to your work. My big question as it relates to my brother is that he's had two direct Sasquatch encounters, a Skinwalker Ranch type animal encounter and a UFO encounter. If I didn't trust him 100%, I would think a person like this was watching too much sci-fi. I am of the belief that he is somehow, for lack of a better term, connected or tapped into this paradigm, if you will. It makes me wonder if these people were also, as you have stated, in some way chosen and perhaps they had a previous paranormal experience. I should add that we are of paternal German ancestry. My brother does not have the desire, nor will I allow him to hunt or hike alone, wink and a nod. Dave, I'm grant grateful for your work and all you do, how you do it, and for sharing it. I hope this qualifies as strange. Yeah, strange. So there's, uh, there's some researchers who believe, I don't know, that you're like tagged. And once you're tagged during your life, you'll see a lot of things that the normal public won't. And whether that's the entity opening up something in our visual spectrum that most people don't have open, or if it's them obviously allowing you to see what other people never will. I've heard this hundreds of times. And I've met people that have had encounters and have seen things that few have ever seen, but the people have had a lot of them. So tagged may be the word. Thanks for the story. Next one. Okay, I have a few stories for you. In 95, my first wife and I drove to Yosemite for a day. We pulled off the road into a pullout inside the park towards the top of the summit before we got down into Yosemite Valley so we could do a little hiking. We parked the car about 20 yards from the highway. We got out and made sure all four doors were locked on our Chevy Blazer, just like I always do. This was not a trailhead. We were just out going into an open country, maybe a half mile. We got about 30 yards from our vehicle when I started getting a creepy feeling from the forest ahead of us. I stopped for a moment, looked around, and then turned around to look back at our SUV and saw that the rear passenger door was wide open. I immediately yelled to my wife, who was ahead of me, that someone was in our truck. So we both sprinted back to find no one there and no evidence of the door being forced open. Now, what's important for you to know is we had never lost sight of our SUV. From where we were, we could see everything, our blazer, the entire pull out the highway, and neither heard nor saw anyone or anything that could have opened both our vehicle door without being seen or heard. Afterwards, we were both so creeped out by it that we decided to just leave and continue to drive into the valley instead. So what was it? A guardian angel protecting us from the eerie forest by distracting us with the opening of our truck door? I guess we'll never know. So before I go on, I'll tell you a story. Angie and I were in Colorado, and uh, we were hiking this trail. We were going to spend the day hiking. And her and I are fastidious in locking doors, closing doors, making sure everything's secure. And uh, on this day, it was probably 11, 11.30, and we got to the trailhead, took off, and we had a lot of weird things happen this day on the trail. One of the weird things was is that about four miles in, this bird, and I don't even know what kind of bird it was, 
was following us. And every time we stopped, the bird would stop and sit on a log almost within arm distance of us and just look. And this bird hung with us for probably two or three hours. And both of us commented like, that's never happened before. Then uh, the end of the day, about six or seven o'clock, come back out of the trail. No other cars are there. And all four doors of my truck are wide open. And there were some very valuable things inside Angie's purse. Nothing was moved, nothing was touched. We still talk about that day today. So what this person said, I believe it a thousand percent because it happened to us. What's going on? I don't know. A message that, hey, there's somebody with a lot more control around you than you think. I don't know. The last story really isn't a paranormal one, but I'll still classify it as unexplained to what really creeped me out. In 97, I drove to Pinnacles National Park for a hike. I set out on one day of hiking trails and got in about a half a mile when I started to get an uneasy feeling, but I brushed it off and kept going. Stop again. So Pinnacles is right near Hollister, California. And when I was a kid, I lived in Cupertino and Hollister was about an hour and a half drive from our house. And myself and a friend named Paul Nelson would always go down to Pinnacles to go rock climbing. And uh, we used carabiners and rope and harnesses. And we, there's, there's a great hike there called the Hatchet. And we climbed it a lot, very challenging. And we had a lot of fun there. It's giant boulders everywhere. I don't know how many times I've been there, maybe 50. And we had some great times there climbing. I never felt creeped out, but I can definitely see how that could happen there. A little bit about my youth. About 30 feet, my uneasy feeling started to turn into a creepy feeling, so I stopped and looked around, which included suspiciously looking both up and down the hiking trail. Nothing. No one was around me because I was on the east side of the park, which was the least visited site. So again, I brushed off the unwanted feeling, kept walking. After about 20 steps, my hair stood up on my back and my neck, and I got an immediate feeling that I was being watched. So I stopped again, looked around, and still couldn't see or hear anything close to me, so I reluctantly walked on. Stopped there. Folks, you get a feeling like this. Get out. Don't wait for something bad to happen. God's given you this gift, use it. Hmm, something bad, I'm, I'm feeling ill, I'm, I'm feeling watched, get out. Still couldn't see or hear anything close to me, so I reluctantly walked on, except this time I had only taken two steps before I looked up at the peaks of where I was hiking to and immediately heard, if you go up there, you won't be coming back down. And those words were coming from inside of me. I started to get really angry because I really wanted to hike to the top. But my gut, my intuition, my inner alarm system, or whatever you want to call it, said no. So I started back down the trail to the parking lot and eventually forgot about the whole thing. Until I heard you being interviewed on Coast to Coast in 2011 or 2012 about mysterious disappearances in America's parks. And that's when it hit me. It suddenly hit me. I remembered my attempted hike up towards Pinnacles. I then immediately thought, if I have kept going, could I have ended up as a missing person in one of your books about people mysteriously disappearing in the woods? Possible. I guess I'll never know the truth. Well, I'm glad you listened to your inner voice. Don't wait next time. Don't push the limits of things. Remember, before you go to these places, check the weather. That's huge. Tell someone where you're going, carry a GPS locator, carry a personal transponder, carry a map, water and bars. And if you don't come out of there on time and you don't text your friend that you're out, tell that friend you want them calling search and rescue. And that has to be someone that you truly trust a lot. Thanks for that story. And that's funny, Pinnacles is a 
holds a warm place in my heart. Been there so many times. And I was thinking about this after I read that story the first time. I don't ever remember anything creepy happened there. Okay, Dave, I'm a long time houndsman. We've ran coon dogs in probably 20 states. I'm from the upstate of South Carolina. I've hunted behind national champion and world champion coon dogs. Dogs with no quit. Dogs that would cross huge rivers. These dogs are bred for one thing, to leave the truck as fast as possible to find the prey. No junk, no half-assed dogs. I'm talking dogs that would sell for $20,000 plus. First night of this incident that happened, we were in Union County, South Carolina, where the French Broad River joins a smaller river. We stopped on a bridge to let the dogs go. Two dogs who were absolutely hard-nosed hounds left the truck as normal, went 150 yards, suddenly turned around, and jumped back in the box. Absolutely would not come out. They balled up in the back of the truck and refused to move. A small detail in the grand scheme of things, but something was in there. Something unexplainable. Something they have never seen before. It takes a lot for a dog that is used to running free at night, running across every predator known to man, to refuse to hunt for an unknown reason. <sighs> yeah. I, I've met a few hound dogs in my day. They are tough. They are not afraid. For these dogs to do that, something was up. And that is the reason that if you have a dog, take that dog hiking with you for a big reason. Dogs have senses that we don't. They sense things way before we do. And if you pay attention to how that dog reacts, the same way as a horse, the way a horse reacts or a mule, pay attention to their reactions. Dave, I've written to you in the past about an experience I had in the mid 70s while backpacking in Washington State. Your comment after the reading my communication was I was fortunate to be alive. I'll retell the story as best I can to you now, hopefully jogging my memory and yours. The reason I recall my experience was upon reading Missing 411 Western Edition, I believe there was a chapter on a hiker that completely disappeared in the same location that I hiked. Don't recall the date of the missing hiker in the book, and I can't double check as I donated the book to my local library. Thank you for doing that. And if you have one of my Missing 411 books and they're sitting on a shelf and you don't want them, don't throw them away. Give them to a library. My experience was in the Enchantment Lakes area around Leavenworth, Washington, not too many miles away from Lake Wenatchee. This area now appears to be a hot spot for a cluster. In the 70s, we had no idea of concern for the backwoods, except for the typical stuff, black bears, bug bites, and the like. I had fished Icicle Creek near Leavenworth many times in the 70s, and the creek followed a national forest road that ended at a trailhead parking location. As I grew a bit older, I began hiking the area and using this parking lot as a start point. In the story I'll begin now, I had taken two friends with me. Neither of them had much experience hiking. I was reasonably seasoned and was comfortable hiking that area. We started out at the trailhead with our packs loaded and began to hike three miles to Eight Mile Lake. The trail was moderate and led to little, little Eight Mile Lake through a boulder field and onto Eight Mile Lake. We had no issues at that point in the day. Through a boulder field. Hmm. What have I told you about boulder fields? Be very careful. <clears throat> Stay together. I checked the weather and knew that thunderstorms were possible that day. I recall mentioning to my friends, but being in our teens, we took on the challenge without a second thought. That was dumb. Of course, there was no available technology, such as a locator beacon back in that area for personal use. Once a person was on the trail, he had only other folks on the trail for communication. As we hiked the trail, which gains about 1,300 feet in elevation, I kept an eye out for weather changes. I'd always been a weather buff and could read atmospheric changes well, considering I had no instruments to do so. Just see to my pants observations. Weather prediction was still rudimentary in the mid-70s, so warnings as we see today were unheard of back in that day. 
We arrived at Eight Mile Lake, making pretty good time, especially with new hikers and loaded packs. We began to set up camp in the mid-afternoon and everything seemed to be going well. As camp was being constructed, I noticed that the cloud deck was lowering and the thunderstorms were building up against the Cascades. The site was in midsummer, and if the atmospheric conditions are right in eastern Washington in June, July, and August, the weather can get violent. I mentioned to them that the weather conditions could become a real concern as the day progressed, rain began to fall. I made the call to pack out and not stay the night. They didn't argue with me as I was the most experienced and told them we had not packed for a serious rain event. We finished our dinner before the rains began in earnest and took off for the trail with, in my estimation, more than enough time to get back to our vehicle before dark. Now, Dave, the experience I'm about to relate to you still bothers me to this very day. This happened 50 years ago, but it seems like yesterday. When I read the chapter Missing 411 Western Edition, if I'm recalling correctly about this location, quite literally over the next top and not even a couple miles away as the crow flies, I know I had to get this story to you ASAP. I'm not sure if you kept that letter, so here we go. As we started down the trail, the clouds simply opened up with sheets of rain. I recognized that we were not just experiencing a rainstorm, we were in the thunderstorm. I could feel the electricity in the air and knew we were in for a struggle to get back safely. For safety's sake, I was the last in line. A bad place to be. I wanted to be sure nobody slipped or fell with a heavy pack or what was now a river of water drenching the trail. I let them move down the hill at their own pace and told them to stop often to make sure that the person falling was okay. This was when things began to get strange. I had at that time lived my entire life in Washington. I knew the area well. I had fished and hunted across this location all my young life. I was never fearful to go into the woods and never felt unsafe or afraid even when alone. But that was about to change. If I recall correctly, we left the campsite between four and five, prime time from what I've read in your books for people to go missing. That is correct. Good student. Dave, I can write this to you and you'll understand. About a quarter mile down the trail, the hair on the back of my head stood up, even soaking wet, and I felt as though I was being watched and followed. I fortunately never lost sight of my friends on the trail, and we never got out of speaking range. There were times I literally stopped and turned around quickly thinking another hiking team was behind me. Nobody was there. As we moved downhill, I expected to see something or someone jump out of the trees along the trail. This was truly the first time in my life I was scared for my well-being. In a person's teenage years, fears was never shown, and I don't recall saying anything about this to my friends on the way down. I was watching for their safety on one hand and feeling that I was being the target on another. Here's the other strange aspect to the experience. I remember feeling as though the trail was stretching out, as though it was longer than it had been getting up to the lake. Time was acting abnormally. I can't quantify this. It may have simply been the emotional and physical drain from my responsibility of getting my friends and myself out of there uninjured. I don't know. The other bizarre issue I had was that several times during the descent, it seemed to be too quiet, as though the rain had no sound. Maybe the river or water on the trail covered the acoustics, but this was happening in a thunderstorm. It should have been intensely loud. The trip down was very slow and wet. It took hours to cover that real estate. Fortunately, we get back to the trailhead at twilight. We are soaking wet, and just getting the packs off and in the vehicle was a chore. We were dead tired. We drove out in the dark, made it back in Leavenworth in one piece. As we came to find out, and adding one more element to the possible 411 story, that rainstorm set a record rainfall for a 24-hour period at the time. Did I make that right call leaving? I don't know. It was a dangerous situation at best, and staying the night in the storm seemed like a bigger problem to me at the time. We were kids. I made the best choice I could. The other thing, I'm a German. This experience is now 50 years in my past, and I've told it the best I could. To recap, this, there was water, granite, and a boulder field. You'll still find the boulder field in the description of this hike. I had an, onset, I had an odd sense that I was being followed and watched. I had an issue with the trail seeming to stretch out in time. We had a serious weather incident, and my ancestry is German. I hope, Dave, that one day you'll put all these pieces together and find an answer to what's going on. To this day, I'm a bit reticent to enter the woods alone. I do have a locator beacon. Glad you do. Everyone should have one. Thank you. 
After reading your books, I know I'm not alone in my experience. Like you've mentioned before, I consider myself fortunate to have walked out of the woods that day. Best wishes to yours. I do pray for you and Ben in my daily rosary. Keep up the good work, and I know the village is there for you when you need us. Thank you very much. You know, I've been in those situations hiking before where you have to make a call whether you're leaving whether you're staying. And those are hard things to judge. And a lot of it depends on experience and the people you're with. And the place you were camped at, how safe and secure it was. So, I have some really interesting cases for you today. Got three of them. And I'm going to tell you that these cases, the one I'm starting off with, was one of the strangest ones in California that I ever researched. And the, the boy's name was Dickie Sudin, S-U-D-E-N, he was three years old. And the family was from San Francisco originally. They were high rollers. But they were living during their summers in a place called Goodyear's Bar in the Sierras. And it was northeast of Sacramento. Uh, the dad was an entrepreneur and he owned a mine in the area of his res residence near Goodyear's Bar. The Bush Creek Gold Mine was the name. Joseph, the father, was the assistant superintendent and Dickie, their son, was a lone child, stayed with the mom during the day. Their house was right next to the Yuba River, which goes through Yuba, uh, Goodyear's Bar. Well, on November 1st, 1945, it was a cold day, and Dickie was outside playing with his dog. And that dog would go everywhere with Dickie. First, let me show you where this is at. So let's pretend that you're northeast of Sacramento in the foothills of the Sierras. This is the Yuba River. This is a place called Devil's Canyon. Gee, just a hop, skit and away up from where the residence was. Goodyear's Bar. Now, I want you to pay attention to this while I tell you. So, the mom left Dickie alone for just five, 10 minutes at a time. She went outside one time and couldn't find Dickie. Starts looking around. Well, their dog's name was Hyde, H-E-I-D-E, -E, and they start, she starts calling Hyde and Dickie and nobody's answering. And she's getting really nervous. Well, this is, a, this is a lonely country road, and she flags down the first car that comes by, and it's a guy named Dr. Guy Cahoon. He's a professor from Ohio State who's on vacation up in the Sierras, and he stops and he offers to help. And they start looking around, and nobody's finding or hearing anything. Guy walks up the trail, and coming back down the trail, away from the river, is Hyde. And Dickie's not around. Well, pretty soon, the Sierra County Sheriff arrives, a deputy named Dewey Johnson. Dewey was a good man. And he immediately starts searching. He calls for reinforcements. In 1945, there weren't a lot of Sierra County Sheriffs. But he starts looking around, and he goes up the trail, and he goes way up into the mountains. And about a quarter mile away from the residence, in a very steep section of the trail that Dewey said there's no way a three-year-old Dickie could have gotten there, he finds one of Dickie's gloves, his mittens, because it was cold. Well, within the next couple days, they bring in all kinds of search and rescue people, canines, everyone you can imagine. They take the canines to the point where Dickie's mitten was found. Dog walks in a circle and sits down. No scent trail. It's in the middle of nowhere now. Nobody lived around them. Nobody was heard or seen. And hundreds of people start showing up to help. I wonder, I was like showing these. These are some headlines of the story at the time. Second and third day of the search, 
Storm hinders hunt for missing Dicky Tomb Sedin. Thursday, the dog trained to stay with him has returned home in the family's cottage in Downeyville. Downeyville was the closest big city. It actually happened in Goodyear's Bar. Hope for the safety of three-year-old Dickie Tumsidine dwindled today as two trailing dogs, scent sniffing dogs, appeared unable to pick up a scent of the child. It's not normal, folks. So, on the fourth day, surprisingly, FBI agents showed up. Sierra County Sheriff said they never called them. They didn't know how they got there. They didn't know why they were there. Well, the news crews on the scene went up to the FBI and said, hey, can we have your names? Nope. Can you tell us why you're here? Nope. That was it. So this time they had forest rangers, volunteer trackers, 250 soldiers had showed up and were searching the mountains. It was amazing. A week-long search, they found nothing. It's a picture of Dickie and his mom. Now, the river was searched, but that, that isn't the way the dog went or Dickie went, so that was a mute point. They never found anything. This is a wealthy couple, so they thought that maybe he was kidnapped. There was never a ransom demand. The weather changed, encumbered the search. He left with his dog. There was no scent trail, no tracks that others could find other than around the the house. The FBI arrived, didn't talk to anybody, wouldn't say that they would help. But yet three weeks after this event happened, the FBI sent Assistant Director E.J. Connolly to investigate a possible kidnapping on this event and on an event that happened in San Jose about three hours away within two weeks of this incident. Now Connolly never said anything publicly but then again, Dickie was never found. This area of the Sierras gets really remote, especially in 1945. Dickie was a small child, and it was emphatic that nobody believed that their dog, Hyde, would leave Dickie for any reason. But it did. Now, what happened that Dickie lost his mitten? How would that mitten have come off? Why wouldn't other canines have picked up the scent from where the mitten was found? Do you know how many cases I've cited like this <clears throat> and I've written about over the years? Kids just vanishing? No logical explanation? Makes no sense. Being an only child, I can't imagine the Sudines leaving Goodyear's bar without their boy. Devastating. I'm going to touch on a topic that uh, I've known about for years. And I'm going to touch on one case involving a huge number of cases. That's the Highway of Tears cases in British Columbia. The overwhelming number of women that have disappeared on that roadway have been Native American women. And most of them have been high risk individuals, meaning dabbled in drugs, narcotics, prostitution, etc. And they're into the double digits now with bodies being found. And they have an RCMP task force that's been working these cases for a couple decades. And they have not developed any viable leads. I'm gonna tell you about one case that the RCMP said didn't match the other cases in their estimation. And that's why it was originally classified as a missing persons case, then reclassified as suspicious circumstances, and then reclassified as what they think is criminal. But they've been very tight-lipped about it. And it's a, about a girl named Nicole. And uh, her last name was H-O-A-R. 
she was 24 years old. She disappeared June 21st, 2002 from Prince George, British Columbia. Later in her life, she was raised in Red Deer, Alberta. She graduated from high school and went on to graduate from Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. She was working the summer of 2002 for a company called Celtic Reforestation, <laughs> Celtic Reforestation, and she was a tree planter. Well, she had a week off of work and on the 21st of June, uh, all of her friends got together and she has to be dropped off and they dropped her off sometime June 1 and 4 p.m. at a gas station, a Mohawk gas station, on Gautier Road in Prince George. So, she's last seen on Gautier Road. She was heading towards Smithers, about a four-hour drive. She told her friends that she was going to hitchhike that. Her friends said, no, please don't, please don't. All of them said, please don't, please don't. She said, she'll be fine, blah, blah, blah. They dropped her off at the gas station. It's the last time she was seen. Now, you can see all the water around here. Tons of water. Deadly road. She gets dropped off, and she's going to Smithers to meet her sister who lives in Vancouver to go to a summer conference, concert. And it was gonna be a surprise to her sister. And she told her friends this. And her parents didn't even know she was going. So nobody knew except these friends that she was supposed to meet her sister. Now, this is Nicole. Blue eyes, brown hair, 5'8", about 125 pounds. Now she was gonna go surprise her sister she doesn't show up. The 29th of June, Nicole doesn't show up back at work at the tree planters. Well, now this is a week after they dropped her off. The administration calls her parents. Parents say, well, we haven't heard from her. Calls the sister, sister hasn't heard from her. That instigates the biggest search in British Columbia history that started at that Mohawk gas station. It was an amazing search. Ground, air, helicopters, twin otters. She was eventually reported missing on July 2nd. She was the first woman to go missing in this area since 1995, but the sixth woman to go missing since 1990. This was the second woman to disappear hitchhiking going to Smithers. Now, when the RCMP says she didn't ma match the profile, she was Caucasian, college grad, no divorce, ultra stable, and working. The profile of the victims, Native American females, young, low education, many arrests, high risk tendencies. Police said they can't see the linkage to this case but they did classify it from missing to suspicious. Couple of things. I am not sure Nicole was aware of the dangers involved on this road because she was smart enough to understand that there, if she knew it, there was extreme danger in hitchhiking in this part of British Columbia extreme and her family did respond to the search her brother came out and searched his heart out the story had legs 15 years 20 years later 20 years 19 years later it's still getting a lot of press where are all of these girls and there's a lot the only reason I even touched on this is because they said it didn't match the rest of the cases of missing hitchhikers. Do I think Nicole is part of this serial killer? Yeah, my gut tells me probably, yeah. 
All of the girls that are missing are dark hair. Nicole had dark hair. She probably wasn't as streetwise as she needed to be to stay alive. To any young lady, even young man, that's listening, I could tell you that the serial killers out there, and there's probably 10 in North America working right now, if not more, most serial killers are not dangerous looking. They're not threatening. The reason that they are so successful is they appear non-threatening. And it causes people to drop their guards around them. Ah, you know, he's a frail guy or he's passive, he's polite. I can, I can trust him, I can get in. But once you're in that car and you're driving along, you're dead. If they want you dead, you're dead. What are you going to do? Jump out at 65 miles an hour? Hmm. It's a very, very sad thing to explain to a family that somebody's missing and still hasn't been found 19 years. And Nicole and her family deserve more. So don't hitchhike. Please don't hitchhike. Next case involves a 17 year old boy in Italy on an island called Malta. And right when I followed and heard about this case, I knew right away something was really odd. He went missing July 18th, 2016, 17 years old. He was from Oldenburg, Germany. He graduated at the top of his high school class. Brilliant young man, Michael Mansholt. Well, he got out of school, took some tests, and he ended up testing at the highest ever for Airbus Corporation to be a pilot. And in Germany, they take you into their training for four years and you can become a pilot. It's a great job. Michael was on his way. And as a gift for graduating so high in his high school class, his parents uh, gave him time away in Malta. Now, I know a, a U.S. parent would say, that's so stupid to let your kid go to another country unsupervised. You don't know what could happen. Well, Michael had been a world traveler with his dad. He'd been to the Yukon Territory gold hunting, gold panning for weeks. And they traveled to other places equally as bizarre just to have fun. His dad trusted him. Well, he was traveling with his girlfriend too. And the girlfriend stayed with him on Malta uh, until July 8th. So the, she had to go home on a return flight that was already booked. They were staying in a place called the Dingley Cliffs. Well, on July 17th, Michael was scheduled to fly back to Germany and he wasn't on the flight. Well, he was staying at the same hotel that he and his girlfriend were at and his dad called the hotel and wasn't getting satisfactory answers about what was happening. And finally, he files a police report with the Italian police and they do a search. And on July 26th, they did that search and his body was found at the bottom of a cliff with no shoes. First of all, there's Michael. Healthy, healthy young man. The backstory was is that when his girlfriend left on the 18th, Mike rented a bicycle and took off on a bike ride. He was carrying a GoPro camera, wallet, and he's found at the bottom a 10-story drop off a rocky cliff. Police find his sunglasses and shoes further down the cliff. 
And they figure that he had been there since the day his girlfriend left, they thought. They couldn't find a GoPro camera, his wallet, his backpack, or his camera. Now, this is the island of Malta. Italy would be up here. And this is where they found the body in the Dingley Cliffs area. Lots of water. Now I'm going to keep, I want you to remember Michael here. So the parents fly to Malta and they knew something was weird because people weren't helping them. They weren't talking a lot. They just felt odd. And they had the body shipped to Germany and they paid for a second autopsy. Well, the coroners on the second autopsy said that some of Michael's organs were missing. They only found a left kidney, a spleen, and some large intestines in the body. Well, the Italian coroner said that the body had sat in the sun and his brain had putrefied along with several other organs. And they also stated that rodents had eaten part of the body. So the Italian coroners couldn't determine a cause of death but said there was no foul play and no answers. Now here's the kicker, the real kicker. There were no broken bones or bruises on the body, yet he was found 10 stories down at the bottom of a cliff. The bike had a scratch and a flat tire, that was it. What happened to Michael Mansell? No shoes, there's a key point to me. His shoes were off, but laying near the bike. The scenarios were, that the police laid out, was, well, it could have been an accident. <laughs> I guess it could have been, but I doubt anybody can fall down a 10 foot, 10 story. 10 stories is equal to at least 100 feet. A 10 story cliff fall down it and not have multiple bruises and abrasions and broken bones. Doubt that's not gonna happen. But Michael didn't have any. And the bike only had one little scratch on it and a flat tire. Doesn't make sense. They said, well, maybe it's robbery. Except he had no injuries and they couldn't confirm why he even died. So that didn't make sense. Well, then they said, well, it could be suicide. Now they're covering every illogical basis under the sun. And they said, well, maybe he tried to kill himself. Again, <laughs> they didn't find any poisons in his system. He didn't have any broken bones. What happened? Now remember, if Michael was alive at the bottom of the cliff, then he could have gotten up and eventually called for help or walked out. He didn't. He stayed there. It's found laying next to the bike. So my question is, how did he get there? That's number one. Number two, how long had he been there? Corners were a little vague on this. You know by the contents of the stomach how much had digested since the time he had eaten. Well, there's no doubt he'd probably eaten that morning if he died that same day on the day that his girlfriend left. But there wasn't a lot said about that. So how long had he been down at the bottom of the cliff? Remember, I had told you before that many of the cases involve falling. And something or somebody or someone or Michael had fallen or made it appear that he had fallen. But he didn't have those injuries consistent with a fall. Why did he die? That's the biggest question. And then I'll remind you of something. 
The morning that he was last seen was the morning that his girlfriend left. He was seen taking her to the airport and then he came back to the hotel, ran into the bike, and that was the last he was seen. Point of separation. Very eerie case. Now, do I believe that organ harvesting or missing organs are involved here? No, I don't. The explanation given by Malta and their coroners about why there weren't organs in the body make 100% sense to me. And about rodents eating, yeah, I 100% believe that too. If, if there are rodents in that hillside, then it's true. But a small predators, animals eating a human body, absolutely, happens all the time. Those aren't really concerns of mine. The concerns are 411 type concerns. How he got there, why he died, next to water, point of separation, etc., etc. In reading this story, I could tell that Michael and his dad were tight, really tight. And uh, there were more than one time that I took this story. And I uh, talked to Angie about it. Because some stories just ring so true to me. And I can just feel for Mr. Mansell and his loss. Horrible. And the part where Italy did not reach out and help them at a time of extreme need is sad. When he was calling from Germany trying to find out about his boy, people just weren't showing the care and need that they needed to do to help this family. Come on, countries, wake up. But those are the three cases. Nicole, missing June 21st, 2002, from Prince George, British Columbia. You spell her last name, H-O-A-R. Michael Mansholt, 17, missing from Malta, July 18th, 2016. Dickie Sudin, missing November 1st, 1945. Goodyear's Bar, California, northeast of Sacramento. Thank you for being here. You're going to see the links for our various sites under the description of this video and under the pinned comment that I will make at the right under the screen here. That'll be the first comment of all the comments on this video. Do not buy our books on Amazon. Those are resellers trying to rip you off. I'm trying to protect you. you buy our books on our site, $24.99. And our movies, Missing 411, Missing 411, The Hunted, for free on YouTube Movies. Please take advantage of that and watch them. And I read all the comments. I do add comments to the comments at times. So uh, I appreciate everyone participating, the village and, and where we are as a group is refreshing. A great group of people and I thank you for being here. Please invite your friends to join us. If you like the movie, give us a thumbs up. Follow me on Twitter at David Politis at Can Am Missing. And uh, I appreciate your friendship. Have a great week. I forgot to say, Politis out.